Hi, everybody. How are you? Great to see you. Thanks for coming. Uh, are we ready to go ahead and get started, everyone? Okay, cool. So thanks for coming up. I hope that, you, that you've been having a great day, whether you've been in parent-teacher conferences or touring the school. Um, I hope that it's been a good day so far. We've got a really special presentation for you today uh, on the art of Frank Wesley. He was a former Woodstock art teacher. You'll be hearing more about him from Mr. Eicher, as well as his son, Dr. Michael Wesley, who's joining us today. So without further ado, I will ask our principal, Dr. Craig Cook, to give an introduction to our two speakers. Thank you, Jamie. Great to see you all here. Thank you, students, for being here. This is a great occasion, and uh, some of the best of what Woodstock has to offer, where we bring history together, our identities around a, a common theme, which is very interesting in this case, which is art and faith and how they engage. So we're looking forward to hearing from more. Uh, one of our own esteemed colleagues, uh, Professor, or Mr. Stefan Eicher. But first, let me introduce our very special guest from the University of Melbourne, uh, Dr. Michael Wesley. Uh, Dr. Wesley is the Deputy Vice Chancellor International at the University of Melbourne, and he's responsible for leading all the university's international engagements. Professor Wesley has extensive experience in international strategy, our students, some of them were just privileged to hear a talk on the quad, among other things, just uh, about an hour ago. He's worked in higher education, in government, in the private sector, and his research particularly focuses on Australian foreign policy, Asia's international relations and strategic affairs, and the politics of state building interventions. And his most recent book is called Restless Continent, Wealth, rivalry and Asia's new geopolitics. So Dr. Wesley, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on campus. And then without further ado, again, our esteemed colleague, Mr. Stefan Eicher. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Stefan to us. He's been teaching art at Woodstock for these last three years. He, of course, is an alum of Woodstock and he has a master in fine arts and visual arts and an MBA in international development and prior to Woodstock, he helped found and run for 12 years the local New Delhi-based arts organization called Arts for Change with the goal of seeing art shape society with beauty and truth. Stefan took a personal interest in Frank Wesley as an artist after discovering him later in life and wrote a chapter exploring the life and art of Frank Wesley, Michael's father, for a book that he published in 2014 on the topic of art and Christian faith. So Stefan, it's a pleasure to have you address us. Thank you so much. Come forward. Thank you, Professor Wesley, for uh, giving me the chance to speak about your father. I feel adequate, uh, completely inadequate, uh, but I have done some reading from my own personal interest in your father, and um, as I will share, it, it really is an honor to talk about him because I feel we need to be talking more about Frank Wesley uh, for several reasons, and I hope this sharing of the, the little that I have come across and come to learn will um, help support that, uh, that, that uh, statement. So um, let me start with, um, just to give you sort of a taste here, of, uh, or rather, an inter uh, just the overview, and I hope we can get through these. Uh, are really, it's an introduction to Frank Wesley, and uh, that's our overall goal. Hoping that biographical facts help put his art into context, um, looking at specifically at some of his styles and techniques. We have a lot of art students here today, which is really exciting, and you've been working on some similar uh, uh, techniques, but we'll get a little bit into that and then really exploring his, him as a person, his, his personal integrity and religious expression through his art. And at the end, I would be so grateful if uh, Professor Wesley, you could give a response and we'll open it up for questions and answers. So um, to begin with, um, Frank Wesley, uh, um, there's some interesting tidbits of information I'm going to start with. One is that he painted 
the, uh, this image that was used for the first UNICEF Christmas card. Right? There was an initiative of UNICEF that, to raise money for the work they do amongst children. A second interesting piece of information is that he designed the urn that carried Gandhiji's ashes to, uh, uh, for immersion in Allahabad after his, his um, assassination. And in fact, he was, he was given the honor of, Frank Wesley was given the honor of being in the actual boat when they were poured into the river. And uh, this piece, which is considered one of his masterpieces, uh, a, 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 some time back, was um, at the band U2, right? Bono U2 requested its use for one of their campaigns, um, particularly uh, it is an HIV AIDS campaign, but they reached out. There's a sense that his art reached far, right? And um, l um, yet at the same time, there's something very s special about Frank Wesley as a man. And um, he did, he, uh, he worked at the school. He was a part of the, the community here from these years. He started teaching first through 12th grade and was then allowed to just focus on high school, which made it a bit easier for him. But for, um, Frank Wesley was a prolific artist and he loved the outdoors. And he would, be, he would go, at least this is from what I'm, I've read about him. And so again, any, please uh, correct me if I've gotten any of these facts wrong, but he spent a lot of time walking the hills and would constantly be creating. So much so that um, people, uh, well, there was an, the annual Mayfair, which was what back then, and it became, I think, June sale, and I'm not sure what we're calling it now, but there's the, the annual kind of ev event. He set up a table and would sell these works that he made, and it became very popular, and even after he left Woodstock, that continued on for another 10 years. Um, but there were, the stories are of people would visit him. Of course, in those days, telephones didn't exist. So if you had to communicate something, you had to go to their house. And they would literally purchase art off of the easel and because of just the beauty of what he was produ producing. Small anecdote, when we had a reunion, uh, an alum reunion, uh, sorry, when the Wonwosa ran their uh, a reunion, last year, it was a virtual reunion, some of the alum artists presented their work and Mr. Steve Alter, who's a writer, his entire presentation was about how Frank Wesley as a visual artist influenced him as a writer. And I'll, there'll, there'll be a little bit of an insight into that in a bit. But the response from the participants was remarkable. And these were the, an older generation of alums but there were people, after the talk was over, the, the, the participants gave their responses, and one after the other had memories of Frank Wesley. And one of them, these were in their, they're in the 60s, 70s um, uh, years of age, and one of them was emotional. as <laughs> She was speaking about Frank Wesley, saying, I still think about him, and how, what, what, you know, how he invested in me, and, and, and what I, I, still re I still remember things that he told me. So he's, he at, he, this is one aspect about Frank Wesley I wanted to bring up. There's another, and I'll, I'll, I hope I'm not gonna take really long with this, but I think it's an important an anecdote. Um, I, I was a student at Woodstock, and uh, back in uh, class of 90, uh, four years here, and a lot of time I spent in and out of LCH, right? As you enter LCH, uh, there's a foyer and there's a big wall on the right, and most, many of you will be aware of that space. But when I was here, in, back in the 90s, there was a big painting on that wall. And I always noticed it because of the size. But I didn't really understand it because it was very brown due to the ravages of time and, and it was, had been lacquered and that lacquer had turned brown. And, but it was obviously a very old painting. I didn't know who made it. And I, 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 when I returned to Masuri as an adult, it had disappeared and I didn't notice. Uh, in 2010, the, in, I read in the uh, alum newsletter of the discovery of a Frank Wesley masterpiece. Mm. And it had been discovered in the attic of LCH. 
And then the school took it and with, in partnership with INTAC, uh, Delhi, restored it. And that painting called um, Jesus Healing the Sick is the one that you guys see every day in the library if you were look, to look up. Okay? Um, but the reason I bring this up is that that discovery in many ways is, was kind of my experience. And I, I suspect the experience of many of others in my generation and, and your old generation, that you're, you younger folks, underlining the need, I feel, for us to talk about Frank Wesley. To, why? Okay, I'll just list out really uh, um, uh, briefly the connections to, his, to our history. He is part of our heritage and uh, to us as a Worcester community, as art students, he was his model. He spent, after studying, um, uh, after college, he spent an additional 18 years pursuing education. He was an IB learner. He was a lifelong learner. Um, and um, his, then his fascinating expression of religious and personal faith through, this, through his art, which is something we're wanting to look at, which both inspires Christians of, who come from countries that are non-Western. And we'll look at that a little bit, but also enriches us as a community in general. And finally, because of his example and the, his personal model of integrity. So, the facts, and as you art students know, the facts help you put the artist's work in context, right? That's one of the basic IB ideas, is you need to know the context of the, at the point of creation. Um, Frank Wesley grew up in a very small uh, part of a UP called Azamgar. It's now, of course, that's the, the, the district, but, um, and it's now a bigger town. But back then, it was a village. His mother was a doctor in a small Australian mission hospital. And that's where she met his father. Uh, who was in charge of the boys' hostel. Um, they were fifth generation, uh, 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 they were the fifth generation of a Christian family, so they had their roots both in Hindu and Muslim um, families. But um, what was fascinating about Frank Wesley as a child was that he spent a lot of time in the village. His, his house literally opened up into the village, and he was just naturally curious. And so we see that as he's making these paintings, he's constantly drawing on those experiences of his childhood, the objects, the scenery, the experiences, and very much the exposure he had to being from a Christian family to friends and neighbors of various other faiths. These are, all giving, are giving you also a little bit of a sense of the, 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 comb, the variety of styles that Frank Wesley um, utilized, and we'll get to that point in a little bit, but one very important event in his life to help understand the artist. And that was that while as a child, um, Frank Wesley experienced, uh, went through typhoid fever and lost much of his hearing. And this is a very important uh, and interesting fact because, and there's, I've read about this and I'll, I'll take the uh, liberty to read out uh, from Nancy Ray who spent a lot of time with uh, Frank Wesley and wrote a book about him. Um, but she puts it this way, he'd, he'd always, he was a very friendly man, very energetic, uh, witty, uh, well-liked, very empathetic, but this is what she says. The quietness of his inner world, once he experienced deafness, uh, <clears throat> seemed to have led to a sense of self-control and gentleness, and the spiritual seeking of his soul, which found its own way without relying much on outside stimulation. There's a sense that there was this inner, Frank Wesley had in, in almost in, in, a, as a result of this experience, an inner strength and an integrity, a peacefulness, yet a person of, great, of strength and confidence. And it's something that I thought I'll point out at the beginning and I'm gonna remind you at the end because it has to do with our, one of our guiding principles 
of wholeness, of integrity, of this sense of, not, of, of having an undivided nature, right? Our internal life, we, we, we hide it, we put on these facades, right? It's understandable. We're at, at every age, and yet there's an, in, the wholeness has this, is being inside the same person that you're outside. And this is something very striking about Frank Wesley, and had a, uh, was, was profoundly, uh, um, had a profound impact on the art that he made. All right. Style, technique. Frank Wesley was known for uh, something called the Lucknow Watercolor School. And this is a, a process of taking a sheet of paper, and as many of us are, have been practicing in our art class, working wet on wet, making it wet to start with, placing uh, paint on it, but once it dries, putting it back uh, and actually submerging it under water, bringing it out, letting it dry, painting on it, and again submerging it under water, an exhaustive process. Um, but the result of it is these, very, these glowing colors, these extremely soft textures, and kind of a luminosity that uh, uh, this particular style that Frank Wesley uh, worked in was famous for. Another interesting aspect of his style uh, is something that you will notice in these images in terms of the eyes and what's called a very calli calligraphic line, a very gently flowing, gracefully flowing line. And now this is no accident, and this is kind of where we're starting to understand Frank Wesley's religious art. These are not Frank Wesley's uh, uh, paintings. These are paintings found in Ajanta, the caves, right? And what happened in Indian history is that there was a, a school of art that reacted to basically the British telling Indian artists paint this way, which was, British Raj company style, where they commissioned Indian artists to paint the way they wanted, very European, very representational, or other styles where we have Rajiv Rav, Rav, Ravi Varma trying a more of an Indian representation and yet using a lot, mostly European convention. Um, Ab Abindranath Tagore was the nephew of um, um, Rabindranath Tagore, thank you, and uh, he launched this, what was called the Bengal Renaissance in terms of the art, or the Bengal Art School. His student, Bhareshwar Sen, was sent to Lucknow to take to, as, as, to, uh, as a principal of an art school, which is the art school that Frank Wesley joined. And here's the thing, Frank Wesley and Bhareshwar Sen established a very strong relationship. And it was a Guru Chela, or Guru Shishya, form of education that, that profoundly affected his understanding of education itself. In fact, it's one of the reasons why uh, he actually ended up leaving Woodstock because he was frustrated with, he couldn't fit in with this Western system of education. And I think from what I understand, he tried to bring in an Indianness, more of this Guru Shishya style, but it failed. Um, there were other reasons as well for his uh, eventually leaving, we'll get to that. But uh, this cannot be uh, un underestimated, the profound relationship he had with Bhareshwar Singh. Now going back to the images that you saw, what is this image about actually? Any ideas? Birthing. Birthing? Childbirth. Childbirth, wonderful. Anything more specific? Ah, you gave it away. Jesus, this is a nativity scene. All right, this is... And uh, it, uh, Frank Wesley called it nativity with women attending, right? So he's taking a, a, a biblical event and he's connecting it to his own experiences of the village. He's, he's seeing it through the eyes of his knowledge and, and experience of the village. Does this sound familiar? It's, it's a continuation of that Chris, uh, the Christmas story, right? Mary and Joseph, they can't find a place in an inn, and they end up in a stable. And uh, 
the village kids come to take a look at who appeared. So there's different styles that Frank Wesley is using, but it's interesting that these are, he's starting to present stories that he's read in the Bible and through with the idiom, with the language, with the experience that he's had in terms of rural India. Um, this is an interesting uh, 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 image because it, one of the ways that Frank Wesley ended up finding a uh, kind of financial uh, 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 support for what he was doing and encouragement along these lines was, was a magazine that, a, that, a, the, um, that was started for Christians in the villages and they wanted, they approached uh, Frank Wesley and asked, could you make paintings of biblical stories and that we want to include in this magazine? And so every month he would make another painting for the magazine and what would happen, and they were printed on in color. And so these local families who were, uh, would t take the paintings out and put them um, and frame them. And for the, these, these, these Christian communities in rural India at the time, it was the equivalent of their, their neighbors, the Hindu neighbors, putting up the, the calendars of the Raji, Ra, Ravi, Raja Ravi Varma um, uh, calendars of, the God, of gods and goddesses. And so it helped them kind of give an expression of their faith, just as uh, their neighbors were. Um, he also ended up... Um, uh, working in miniature, and this is something, I don't know, can, can anybody see the angel? So it's the biblical story of where, when the angel comes to Mary and tells her, you are going to give birth to the savior of the world. Yeah? Should I give it away? Yeah, there she is. Right? And she's, she's touching Mary's feet. It's a very, very deeply uh, Indian understanding of respect, giving respect to this teenage girl who's going to play this outsized role. Right? Um, nativity. There's another nativity. And uh, to Frank Wesley, this, this cow was a mother cow, shielding Mother Ma the, um, uh, Mary. Um, he talked about um, uh, Mother India, symbol of Mother India. Uh, behind it is, uh, there's a halo and a, um, uh, a tree uh, that is symbolic of death. So kind of a foreshadowing of the birth of Christ and the death of Christ. Uh, it's a cypress tree. With, um, flight to Egypt. Right? This is uh, inspired by Rajput miniatures of... Uh, Lord Shiva and Parvati that were very common at the time. And even the, the handing of this bowl of milk is uh, based on Shiva ha handing a, a, a bowl of milk to the, the snake that is ar wrapped around Lord Shiva's um, neck. And so you're starting to see that as with his exposure, he's looking for, of course, he's being asked to make uh, imagery that expresses uh, uh, stories from the Bible, but it's going somewhere deeper. Um, this, uh, he spent uh, some time in, in Japan, that 18 years, there was four of those years he was in Japan studying Japanese art, and you can see the effect of some of us who've, who've done our research paper on Hokusai will recognize these sharp angles, and um, he was a learner, like I said, and constantly, uh, drawing things in. Now let's go back there and notice the color of the Christ child, right? There again, as a young boy, right? He's basing his understanding of, he's expressing the, his understanding of the divinity of Christ in this idiom. Of course, Krishna is always shown as, as a child uh, uh, in the color blue. The interesting thing is, it's, it's both symbol, and some of us have studied Mr. Franz Mark and expressionism, and, and for Franz Mark, blue was, anybody remember? These all represented different things. Yellow, anyone? 
femininity, blue was masculinity. For some of the expressionists, blue was a spiritual color. They actually had a connection to, they were influenced by Eastern thinking. Um, so as color can be used symbolically in, in, this, in, these, in European religious art, you know? Christ is wearing red and blue. Um, El Greco repeats the same thing. Blue is a sign of, is a color, uh, is symbolic for a truth. Red for sacrifice, right, and so forth. But what's fascinating about these is it's not just symbolism, right? He's, he's drawing on deeper roots here. Um, uh, sim symbolism, I, and um, there, this is just packed with symbolism. He brings in something abstract here, so he's melding together different influences um, into a, a Rajput miniature, right? And these birds symbolize the peacock, the glory of God, um, asceticism. There's a water bird, which is uh, symbolic for continual happiness or happiness in all circumstances. Uh, holiness up there. A typical of Rajput miniatures, um, a banana on the right, mango on the left, uh, uh, um, blessing and abundance, and, uh, and so forth. Um, just a, a, on the side, he, he, he was a, a, a student of wildlife and made that beautiful uh, miniature there. But um, one thing to, that another just aspect in addition to this, he was very much uh, uh, expressive symbolism and um, but it, for him, the symbol, he, he, if somebody asked him, what does that mean? He would tell them, I, I painted it. You're the one who's supposed to figure it out. <laughs> and it was only towards the end of his life that, we actually, that he started to share more about what these meanings were because he had a sense that his time was, was, um, um, was coming uh, to an end. Um, another interesting aspect here is uh, in terms of symbolry that, that draws on something deeper in terms of his Indian identity, is these forehead, uh, Christ's forehead is, is gold. And that's this, this, this is sem, uh, sim, symbolic of, knowledge, of, of divine knowledge. Again, Christ's forehead is gold, and you can't quite see it in uh, the, this reproduction. But also drawing on, um, on Buddhist iconography, the long ear, earlobes. Uh, do you know why Buddha's earlobes are shown as long? Because he came from a wealthy background, right? He wore earrings, heavy earrings, right? And that's a, that was a physical uh, sign of wealth. And so this image of Christ speaking to, and this is a biblical account of, to uh, another wealth, a, a wealthy man. And, but, um, uh, but, um, um, Frank Wesley presents him uh, using the language of that, uh, that, that is familiar in terms of wealth and, uh, um, and honor. The, the, this he saw as an elongated third eye, the sense that the, the all-seeing eye of God, etc. We can, we can go with each of these, we can keep going deeper, but I need to run through this too fa a little bit faster. But um, Christ the Lord, right? There's something very obviously non-European about him or about the placement of where Jesus is. And that was a reaction to these images. So this is a very famous, I believe in the 50s, this came out, right? A, bl a blue-eyed European Jesus, a white man. Um, this came a little bit later, very famous, I think, in the 80s. Um, but what was Jesus looking, what, what was his ethnicity? You know, was it blonde, I mean literally blonde and blue-eyed, or was it something more akin to this? This is, the BBC did a kind of a reproduction of what Christ could have looked like and came up with this. Very non-European. In fact, you know, very closely linked to even Asia. Of course, middle, he was a Palestinian Jew, but uh, very Asian in his looking, in his features. And that brings us to the masterpiece here. And um, uh, this, some of the symbolism here of, this is the, uh, the story of the prodigal son who takes his father's wealth and before he's died, he takes his inheritance and spends it and ends up hitting uh, the, you know, the uh, dirt bottom 
and comes back to his father. And what's beautiful about this is the fact that the way Frank Wesley composed it is you have to, is your conclusion is the father had to run towards the son to stop him from falling over, from falling forward. And that's, the, that's a very key aspect of the biblical account, that the father runs to the son uh, rather than waiting for the son to come to him. Um, and there's some very interesting things about color that he's used up here. There's a separation of color, and yet as you keep going down, it, it, they mix and they become one color here. Even the, the, the bodies, the two bodies up here are separate, and yet as you come down, they kind of merge into each other. Again, we could, uh, just a point about this was that it was commissioned by LCH, so I'm super curious because I would think it still belongs to LCH. So <laughs> I don't want to say this publicly, but it be interesting. I, there must be a story behind it. But I read about it as a, that they had commissioned Frank Wesley specifically to make this painting for that wall uh, in, in LCH. And this is the other painting that's, that we have here. And just to give, again, a little bit of the context, uh, Frank Wesley, besides going to Japan, he, he studied in, in, in the States, he did an MFA. And at the time when abstract expressionism was big, right? Abstract expression and, uh, expressionists in this group here. And he, uh, so you see this, again, it's a very different uh, feel to everything else he's been doing. Um, but look at this, this is another one he made during, uh, around that time. It's the, the, the again, the, the light is a bit dim, but Cain and Abel, the biblical story of Cain um, killing Abel. And, uh, but very, very, in a sense, expressionist. There's an abstraction to it, but it's also very expressionist. There's another uh, story from the Bible of Christ healing the uh, uh, two demon-possessed men. Very expressionist and completely different. So he's drawing on these influences, but the key is he's not, he's making them his own, right? Because at the heart of it, and this is kind of where I, I was hope um, I wanted to bring this to a, to kind of a conclusion, is that, um, by the way, very, very, very creative uh, uh, um, compositions. This is uh, Peter, walk, Christ calls Peter to have faith and walk on water because Pe Peter and the other disciples are in a boat. And you can see the, the, the creative storytelling here. It's not just illustration, right? The, these disciples, they, are, they, are, they form the shape of a boat. And if you can see it, there's this, there are actually footsteps. Do you see that footstep here? Kind of like, almost like a, a graphic element, like superimposed on top. And then, then there's this aspect here, and it's, it's Peter kind of falling below the waves, you know, and he cries out uh, for help. Um, so very, um, he, um, um, a progression and, and an integration of many styles, and at the end of the day, a personal expression. Um, uh, the, one of the last, wow, I've gone over time, I'm sorry. <laughs> but this, I'll, I'll just bring it to a close here. But uh, this, this an ex, a, a visual expression of his reflection on the idea of the Holy Spirit, right? There's no, interestingly, you can't tell whether it's a man or a woman, right? And um, there's some very interesting things happening in these four corners but the, the, the blue, right, the blue of uh, the color of truth is coming, emerging, uh, or pointing to, to the mouth. Um, using the, the El Ajanta, again, the Bengal school uh, visual uh, idiom here of, a, of how to present eyes. Um, so, um, in closing, just to say that there... Um, that the, the, what, one of the reasons why I, for me, Frank Wesley is, is a discovery, as, it, as he is for, I think, many people in my generation, is that he never became quote-unquote famous. Now, part of that was because his, his primary patronage was the, the, the missionary community who were um, um, commissioning him to make these paintings for the magazine and um, another, uh, another reason is, however, is because he, on purpose, he chose not to become famous. And there were many galleries over the course of his life that wanted him, wanted to represent him, wanted to run major exhibitions. 
and he chose not to. He found that um, it, he, and he, his, his, his friends and colleagues that he studied with were, were pursuing that fame and, and um, uh, uh, with it, you know, a particular, certain amount of wealth. But he, it was a, a, a specific choice. And instead, what we see happening is that he, wherever he is, he finds himself amongst a community of, of, of fans, so to speak, who, who love his work, who, who buy his work as soon as it's off the easel sometimes, you know, even at, when it's still on there, they're asking for it. And uh, that was his, where he found his satisfaction. And uh, it goes back to, I think, what, um, and, and, and even the, the, the courage to take, the, to express his religious faith in these ways, in these ways that are, that are in some, uh, using, um, uh, expressing in, uh, universal truths as well as very specific uh, beliefs that he, he had from, uh, from the Bible. But uh, um, just to go back to the, the statement of, of Nancy, Nancy Ray, that he didn't need to explain himself. Um, that that uh, uh, he found his, uh, his spiritual seeking of his soul found its own way without relying much on outside stimulation. Right? He had an integrity that goes back to our, one of our core guiding principles, which is wholeness, which is saying that that inner part of me needs to be the same as the outer part of me. It's the hardest thing in the world. At, at your guys' age and even at uh, when you, you get older. But there's, that's what wholeness is, is this integration of the inner me is the same as the outer me. I'm not putting on a show. Um, and that was something that, that personally I, I really respect and uh, appreciate about the, what I have found out about Frank Wesley, your father. Mm. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Well, Stefan, I'm, I'm incredibly humbled and, and really quite overcome. Um, ah, um, Dad, Dad would have loved, loved that presentation. I, I, I'm not sure I can say very much because um, I've learnt a lot in, in your presentation and I'm certainly hoping I can get access to the to the video link because I'd love to share it with my family and um, okay what can I say a couple of things um, you've covered just about everything one was just to go back to I guess what I was saying to the students not very long ago and and it was something that I really learned from dad um, so you went back to the history and how he went to um, study in Lucknow with uh, Bariswa Sen. The other thing about Lucknow is that it was part of a, a, a Shiite kingdom and so that art school also had a, a deep tradition of Persian inspired art. And so one of the things that Dad has is a, a collection of Bariswa Sen's miniatures. You know, dozens and dozens of these miniatures. And of course he painted literally hundreds of miniatures through his life. Um, and so when he finished his, I think he did two degrees at Lucknow, um, he won a scholarship. It was a scholarship from a, a very wealthy American art patron who had become aware of his work. And the scholarship basically said, you can go anywhere in the world and study anything. Um, and so this was the early 1950s and he went to Bariswa Sen and he said, I've been offered this scholarship and I'm thinking of going to Iran and because I've been trained in the Persian style to deepen my training in the Persian style. And Bariswa Sen said to him, no, you should go to the art tradition that is most different from the one you have learnt. And that's why he went to Japan. So he went to Japan in the early 1950s. He was, he was deaf. He couldn't speak any Japanese. He learned to speak Japanese and he lived and worked there for five years. And uh, 
Part of his catalogue is some beautiful Japanese-inspired calligraphy, but also very spare Japanese painting. Um, and uh, he fell in love with Japan, but then when he finished in Japan, he came back to India briefly and was studying again. And I'm not sure if it was the same patron or a different one said, once again, you can go anywhere in the world and study whatever you like. And I think Sen was dead by then, but he took that lesson. And so he went to Chicago because he had no experience or feel for modern art. And so that's what you brought out. So I think Dad was always looking for, for difference. He was looking to learn from what was the most different thing. And as I was saying to the, to the students earlier, that is the most profoundly educative thing you can do, is to take yourself well outside of your comfort zone and just study from a completely different point of view. And so hearing you talk about um, his art and, and, and how um, the different styles came out and merged uh, is, uh, was really profoundly moving. Um, there is a, another phase, of course, of his journey, which was Australia. And uh, again, how much profoundly different, more profoundly different from his experience than to go to a country like Australia, um, uh, which, you know, um, had its own incredible landscape uh, and some of his most beautiful pieces of religious art draw on the Australian landscape as well. So that's one point I would make. And I, I, But um, the other point I would make is um, I think Dad's religion was profoundly political and his art was profoundly p political. Um, so you started with the, the urn for Gandhi. So his family was intensely... Uh, involved in the independence movement. Uh, his father, despite running a, a Methodist uh, boys' hostel, uh, it, back in the 1920s stopped wearing Western clothing, would only wear Indian clothing. And I think he picked that up. It became um, an important part of him. Um, when he went to the United States, he became quite heavily involved in the civil rights movement. He designed a lot of the artwork for the civil rights movement. And so I think in the same way, his determination to depict Christian, uh, Christian scenes, Christian stories in a non-Western way was actually an intensely political act. And uh, the established church be it here in India, often in places like the US, um, in Australia, they didn't, they didn't like that. They wanted the blonde, blue-eyed Jesus. Um, they thought that um, depicting the Christ child as a blue figure was importing paganism into Christianity. So he... He, he faced a lot of backlash and he was, I think, very courageous about that. He, he never took a backward step, continued to paint as he wanted to paint. And the last thing I would say is part, part of his politics was the, um, the intense identification with the marginalised. which comes across in the, all of the paintings. So I've said enough. Um, I really want to thank you. I really want to thank Woodstock School. This has been an extraordinary experience. Thank you. Well... Thank you so much, uh, Stefan, first for that uh, such a thoughtful presentation of Frank's life's work. And uh, it serves as inspiration 
uh, to us all. And uh, Dr. Wesley, thank you for allowing Woodstock into your richly personal space. Uh, we all can identify with that. And when I think about your father's life and what we can learn from it, this going outside of ourselves, extending ourselves well beyond our normal boundaries. But your father had the ability to bring it home in a meaningful way. It didn't stay out there. It came home and made meaning and significance to people's lives. And so I think that's certainly my takeaway. And I, I'm sure you all have your own takeaways from this, this intense time. But thank you for letting us in on your personal journey with your father. I uh, really appreciate it. And thank you to all of you staff and students for taking the time to be here for these moments. Uh, these are priceless and we know that we'll uh, carry some of these lessons with you in your own way for the rest of your life. So thank you. Thank you to those of us joining us on the live stream as well. All right. I think with that we're dismissed and we'll have some tea out in the, uh, the backside of the CFI building. Thank you so much.